in there, but tonight after the service, we're going to have a time of fellowship downstairs for a little while. Everyone's welcome to uh, come tonight and stay for the fellowship and uh, have lots of little goodies. Everybody, everybody know what they're going to bring tonight? <laughs> Praise God. I'll be a little secret. I'll be a little surprise. Brother Mark, what do you think about that? I'll be a surprise. Man, I usually like to try about everything. You know, good. <laughs> Let's turn to Psalms 119, if you would, this morning. Psalms 119. Psalms 119. We'll read verses 73 to 80 this morning. Psalms 119. Verse 73. The Bible says in Psalms 119, verse 73, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Let, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause. But I will meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statues, that I be not ashamed. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for each one here today. We pray that you'll bless the preaching of the word of God. We thank you for the good singing, Lord, and that magnifies you, dear Lord. And we just pray if there's a lost soul here in the congregation today, Lord, that you would deal with their hearts and that you would save them before they leave today, Father. We pray for your people, Lord, that you would help us all, Lord, to draw close to you. And God, we pray for our upcoming tent revival, uh, May the 20th through May 27th. We pray, God, that you'll bless the preachers that are coming and the singers. And, and God, we just want you to do some great and mighty things in our old-fashioned tent revival. But Lord, until then, we pray today that you'll do some great things in our hearts and in our lives. We pray in Jesus' precious name. And amen. Amen. Here in Psalms 119, we read verses 73 to uh, verse 80. And uh, this here is like a, uh, Psalms is like a medley. It's like a medley. I, I'm going to preach on the message of your medley. The message of your medley. I don't know about you, but I like good music. I like the music that we just heard. And uh, I like good music that magnifies the Lord. I also enjoy hearing the songs of a beautiful choir. And I'm praying that eventually we can get a choir here uh, in the church. And uh, your life and my life are like a choir in a way. We're all singing songs every day with our lives and people are listening to them, uh, whether they're good or bad. Uh, as Christians, as people who know the Lord, hopefully we're all singing uh, the same song with the same message. Uh, this section of Psalms 119 reveals that our life is a medley and it has a message. A medley is a series of songs performed as one. What songs are you singing with your life and the way that you behave each day? Uh, Mark Hall expressed the importance of pleasing the Lord with the song of our life with these words. He said, empty hands held high, such small sacrifice, if not joined with my life, I sing in vain tonight. May the words I say and the things I do make my life song sing, bring a smile to you. 
Lord, I give my life a living sacrifice to reach a world in need to be your hands and feet. So may the words I say and the things I do make my life song sing, bring a smile to you. Let my life song sing to you. Let my life song sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day, knowing that my heart was true. Let my life song sing to you. And then Charles H. Gabriel also spoke of the song of our life when his pen dripped with gratitude and adoration for Jesus Christ, uh, these words. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus of the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Yeah. And so we ask, does the medley of your life please the Lord? Is he pleased by the way that you're living? Do your attitudes and actions honor the Lord? That should be the sentiment uh, of each and every one of our hearts. Now in this section of Psalms 119, the psalmist expresses the different songs of the medley of his life. His message of his medley is a challenge and example for you and I. I want to give you several things. First of all, notice in verse 73, we have the song about our creator. The song about our creator. He says, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. The psalmist makes it clear that the Lord is his creator. He did not come from amoebas or monkeys, for he was made by the hand of the Lord. Yeah. The Lord is the one that fashioned and formed all of us. Think about this. God took the dust of the earth and formed you in the dark pool of your mother's womb. He used the strands of your DNA to form the features of your flesh like the potter molds the soft clay with his powerful hands. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says. Now, our heart has no battery. It doesn't run on gasoline or nuclear fuel, yet it has not ceased to beat for, for myself, my heart has beat for 61 years. 61, I hope it beats for many more years, amen. Uh, when it began its drum beat after three weeks from my conception, if I live to be 70, it'll have beaten over two and a half billion times based on an average of 70 beats per minute. Folks, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're talking about the song about our uh, creator, Think about it. Uh, God's design for our bodies speaks of his genius. Think about this. He made our tongue so well that in an average lifetime, we will speak over 123 million words. Now, some people will speak many, many more than that. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. May we use it to praise his name and lift up others. He created our eyes so that in our lifetime they will shed 121 pints of tears to keep them clean or to express our joy or sorrow. He robed all of us, he robed us, with an average surface area of 25 square feet of skin with each square inch of it containing 20 feet of blood vessels. To keep our skin healthy, we shed 600,000 particles of skin every hour or about a one and a half pounds a year. By 70 years of age, an average person will have lost 105 pounds of skin. We shed and regrow outer skin cells about every 27 days, which is about a, a thousand new skins in a lifetime. Think about this. I'm talking about our creator now. To move about, we have been given 600 muscles on a frame of 206 bones with 45 miles of nerves and 60,000 miles of blood vessels. What a creator. Amen. Amen. And they say we came from a monkey. As we go about our daily task and something tickles our nose, we have been enabled to sneeze at the speed of 100 miles an hour. 
<laughs> His genius is seen in the design of the stomach, too. Think about, listen to this. Your stomach cells secrete hydrochloric acid, a corrosive compound used to treat metals in the industrial world. It can pickle steel, but mucus lining the stomach wall keeps this poisonous liquid safely in the digestive system. Amen. What a God. Amen. What a creator. God's a genius. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. He deserves the song of praise from our lips, honoring him as our creator. Our song should be, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. The fact that he is our creator reminds us of several principles. First of all, the principles of availability and accessibility. Lord, you made me. What do you want me to do? What do you, uh, what do you want me to do? This, this should be our attitude. Isaiah expressed this sentiment when he said, Here am I, Lord, send me. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. The greatest ability is availability. The person who is available to God has conquered his selfish desires for the sake of pleasing Jesus Christ. Are you available to him? Is your heart accessible to Christ or closed and cold? The principle of availability and accessibility. And then there's the principles of accountability and acceptability. The fact that he's our creator means we are accountable to him. We will answer for our life when we stand before the Lord. If you don't receive Christ as your Savior, of course you die and go to hell forever. But if you're saved, as I mentioned here a while back, a couple weeks ago, you have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If you put your faith in Christ for your salvation, you'll give an account for your faithfulness, obedience, holiness, and your work for the Lord. So is your life acceptable to the Lord? You please Him by the way you live and the attitudes that you have in your heart. Think of this, Romans 14, 12, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There's the principles of availability, accessibility, the principles of accountability and acceptability. Thirdly, there's the principle of approachability. Jesus Christ is our creator, for he is God. Colossians 1.17, I love this verse. And he is before all things, and by, by him all things consist. Amen. Folks, our God is before all things. I want you to think, you and I have a beginning. Yeah. You were born on a certain day, certain, you know, certain year, a certain month. Uh, you and I have a beginning, but God doesn't have any beginning. Think about a being that had, he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. It's interesting to, to note, think about this. <clears throat> God has four ways of making a human body. Four ways. Number one, he can create a body without the agency of either man or woman, as he did when he made Adam out of the dust of the ground in Genesis 2. God can form a body through the agency of just a man, as he did when he formed Eve from the rib taken from Adam's side. Genesis 2. A third way is through the agency of both a man and a woman. This, of course, is the common way, the way that we have received our bodies. And then fourthly, God can also form a body through the agency of just a woman. And that's the way our Lord received his body, born of a virgin. There are no limits to what the Lord can do. With God, nothing is impossible. You say, yeah, but it wasn't just, it wasn't just Mary. She was conceived of the whole Holy Ghost. I know that, but still, it's just a woman as far as from a human standpoint. As our creator, he reached out to us through his creation and his spirit to save our soul. And he wants to have fellowship with us. See, a lot of people think they get saved and that's the end of it. Well, thank God you got saved. You're going to heaven. Praise God. Hallelujah. But there's a life to live here on this earth. And God wants to have fellowship and communion with us every single day of our lives. Thank God. When Christ is your Savior, you have access to the Lord in prayer. We are encouraged to bring our prayers to the throne of God's grace and get God's help for the needs that we have in our life. Because of the blood of Christ, we can approach the throne of heaven. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we can come to the throne of grace anytime, day or night, middle of the night, middle of the day, and pray to God, and God hears our prayers, and he's a prayer answering God. Amen? Amen. So don't waste your opportunities to spend time with God. Enjoy his presence like the fragrance of sweet perfume or the sound of gentle falling rain on a summer morning. And then there's the principle of his adeptness and acquaintance with us. Because the Lord is our creator, he is very familiar with us and knows us very, very well. Matter of fact, God knows you better than you know yourself. He knows all things. Just as the eagle surfs the waves of the rising hot air, scanning with his piercing eyes the land below for his next meal, our Lord sees with greater perception into the depths of a person's heart and soul. He knows what we think and what we feel and how we're faring. He knows all about us. Think about this. He knows the heart that's been broken and battered by burdens and crushed by calamity and crosses to bear. He knows. He knows when doubt and disbelief try to demolish your soul like the giant curl of foaming waves of the sea that slammed their watery fists on ancient shores of sand and rock. He knows. He knows the drain of despair and depression that siphoned the soul of encouragement and energy and excitement and enthusiasm like a deep wound that drains the body of life-giving blood. He knows. He knows when anger and bitterness poisons your heart like the bite from the fangs of a cobra snake. He also knows the devotion and dedication of those who are diligent in their duty to God, even to the point of being persecuted or put to death. Think about this. There is not a word, Psalms 139 says, there's not a word uh, in my tongue that the Lord doesn't know. There's not a thought that in my mind... I mean, even when I think things that I don't say them out loud, God knows my thoughts. That's what how a great God uh, that we serve. God's acquaintance with us leads to wonderful blessing. Blessings. Think of this. Because he knows he is not surprised by our predicaments. Because he knows we have security when life is precarious. Because he knows we have serenity when we're in peril. Because he knows we have solutions to our problems. The Bible says in Psalms 1-6, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. He knows the way of the righteous. Psalms 139, 1 to 3. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsetting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. All my ways. Psalms 44, 21. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Job 23, 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And uh, uh, Ira Stanfill penned his thoughts about God's knowledge this way. You've heard the song. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry over the future for I know what Jesus said. And today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Amen. Amen. The song about our creator in verse 73. And then notice in verse 74, the song about consistency. The song about consistency. See here in Psalms 119.74, They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. How you live will reveal what you truly believe in your heart. The psalmist was rejoicing here in verse 74 that others would be blessed and encouraged by his example and testimony because his hope is in the word of the Lord, he says. He was consistent in his faithfulness because of his confidence in God and his promises. That is where he placed his hope as you and I ought to do. Now let me ask you a couple questions. Are you concerned about your consistency and faithfulness to the Lord? Does your life cause others to rejoice or weep with sorrow because you are sinful, selfish, and have strayed away from the Lord? Your actions do affect other people, whether we want to admit it or not. 
good or bad, our life touches other people. It does. You're, folks, you say, a preacher, my life, I'm nobody. My life don't touch nobody. None of us are nobody. We're nothing. But our lives touch other people, Amen. either in a good way or sometimes maybe, sad to say, in a bad way. I mean, it's something to think about. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to the understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Never underestimate what God can do with a handful of faithful people. For example, I'm talking about consistency now. This song about consistency here in verse 74. It was a stormy night in Birmingham, Birmingham, England, and Hudson Taylor was to speak at a meeting at the Seven Street Schoolroom. His hostess assured him that nobody would attend on such a stormy night. But Hudson Taylor insisted on going anyways. He said, I must go even if there is no one but the doorkeeper. Less than a dozen people showed up, but the meeting was marked with unusual spiritual power. The Holy Spirit moved in the hearts of the people like strong winds from the sea. What was the result of this little meeting? Listen to this. Half of those present either became missionaries or gave their children as missionaries, and the rest were faithful supporters of the China Inland Mission for years to come. God will use you if your life will sing the song of consistency and if you'll be faithful to Him. A songwriter expressed the important truth in this powerful song, Find Us Faithful. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us lead to those behind us. The heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we've left behind, may the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Amen. Think of all the Christians in the last hundreds and thousands of years that have gone on before us. And they passed on the torch to us. And now we're going to be, some of us, you know, the next umpteen years, whenever, we're going to be passing on the torch to others, you see, and children and grandchildren. And we have, we have to live our lives so that they'll see it in us. So there's a song about, uh, we need to, our, lives, our lives need to sing the song of our Creator and, our, and consistency. And then thirdly, notice in verse 75, here's the song about conviction. Conviction. Verse 75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Now the psalmist uh, continued the medley of his life. He sings his song about conviction. He, when, with conviction, he says, I know thy judgments are right. Conviction. He had absolute confidence in God's word and will. He continued to praise the Lord's faithfulness to him, even in his times of trial, trouble, and discipline. With conviction and certainty, he believed that when he was chastened or disciplined by the Lord, he knew that it was best for him. And that the Lord had his best interest at heart. Again, I read verse 75. I know, o Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. That kind of song is a powerful one. It's a song of maturity and reveals just how deep are the roots of your faith in God. I know, he says, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right. Sometimes, folks, you've got to admit it's hard to say that. It's hard to say, God, I don't, you know, I don't understand the ways that you're doing. I don't understand what, why I'm going through this. But, Lord, I know that thy judgments are right. I know that your word is true and your ways are far above my ways. and Your thoughts are high above my thoughts. That's hard to say sometimes, but it's still true. It's no fun being spanked, chastened, but sometimes we need it. Why? Like a stick that has bumps and knots that needs whittled and scraped by a sharp knife, 
We need God's whittling or affliction to knock off the rough edges in our lives. We require it to get us back on the path where we belong. Such was the case with Jonah. We are so easily distracted and have a tendency to wander or float away from the Lord like driftwood from the shores of the sea. God's faithful affliction helps to clear the cobwebs from a heart of apathy. John Newton was the author of the song Amazing Grace. John Newton lived a rough life before. He was a wicked man before he got saved. He said, when people are right with God, they are apt to be hard on themselves and easy on other people. But when they're not right with God, they're easy on themselves and hard on others. God's affliction helps to wake up, uh, helps us to wake up and grow up and change our attitude toward people uh, and so forth. The writer of Hebrews says this, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hebrews 12, verse 11. I'm going to tell you what. I don't like it when I'm chasing in the Lord, but I don't look back over the years that I've been saved. I thank God once in a while he has to take me out to the woodshed and give me a good spanking. Amen. i tell you one thing it shows. It shows he still loves me. Amen. Amen. And he hasn't left me or deserted me, thank God. I read this. Think about this. Eva J. Alexander was born to Christian parents in Chennai, India. True story. She was born again at age 12 during a Billy Graham crusade. In 1963, she married R.D. Alexander, and the two took positions with the Indian government. Eva's job exposed her to the plight of women in her country, and she began speaking out about their status and suffering. For a while, she became so socially active, their spiritual life suffered. Politics became more important than religion. The Lord, however, sent a serious illness that brought her to her knees. God used affliction to change the course or direction of her life. Hoovering near death in the hospital, she cried out to the Lord and said, God, if you're real, please do not allow me to die. I will serve you. Returning home, Eva began reading her Bible Again, and two words in Matthew 21, 31 tore through her mind like torpedoes. The verse says, Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. And the two words that ripped through her soul were, and harlots. And harlots. Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots, Jesus said, go into the kingdom of of God before you. Those words grab, grabbed a hold of Eva Alexander's heart and soul and the harlots. Eva felt that the Lord wanted her to try to reach for Christ, those caught in the grip of prostitution. A week later, a nearby pastor told her of a prostitute who had run away from the brothels and he asked Eva to provide a room for her. Pastor, I can't do that, Eva said. You keep her. Eva had a husband and four children at home, including two teenage sons. But the Lord again brought Matthew 21, 31 to her mind, and Eva relented. Her family was aghast. What is this? You're turning our house into a brothel, they said. But their attitude soon changed, and they accepted this ministry as coming from God. Other girls began showing up, and the Alexander home became a rehabilitation center. Police officers and prisons referred troubled women to Eva. And today, up to 15 women live in the Alexander home at any one time. The Alexanders provide medical treatment, job training, and a strong gospel witness. Eva has started a home for the children of prostitutes where 60 children ages 12 months to 13 years find refuge. Her husband and children joined her work and spurred on by Matthew 21, 31, they are bringing many harlots to faith in Jesus Christ. God used affliction to change Eva's direction and to honor the Lord God Almighty.
Think about it. I want you to think about that. You say, oh, I don't know about that preacher. I want to tell you what, God led this woman. And God, God's got this woman winning souls. Amen. People that need the Lord Jesus Christ. We see here the song about our creator, the song about our consistency, and the song about our conviction. And then just briefly, let me just mention this and I'll close with this and uh, maybe finish this message some other time because I've got several other points. But number four in verse 76 is the song about comfort. The song about comfort. And I'll just briefly say this. Verse 76, let I pray thee, thy merciful kindness uh, be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. The psalmist sings of comfort from God. He sings it to the Lord because he knows that true comfort does not come from alcohol, drugs, money, possessions, or the things of the Lord. It's found in the Lord Jesus Christ and the promises of his word. Amen. I want to say in closing today, I want to thank God for the comfort that we get from the word of God. Verse 76, let I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. I want to tell you what, the merciful kindness of God is very comforting. I don't care what you might be going through this morning. Folks have all kinds of problems and trials in the day and time we live in. But I want to tell you something, folks. We, see, we serve an almighty God today. Amen. We serve a, a great, wonderful God. And uh, I, I'll tell you what, I want to thank God for the song about our creator in verse 73. The song about our consistency in verse 74. The song about our conviction in verse 75. And verse 76 is the song about comfort. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Amen. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for the, thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Psalms 4, 8. I want to thank God for his comfort. I don't know what you might Amen. be going through today, but I want to tell you what. We have the comforter, the Holy Spirit of God. He's able to wrap his arms around you and comfort you like nobody else can in this world. Amen. Let's stand if you would.